The Libyan desert is huge. It's very dry. And it was one of the last places explored on Earth because camels, wonderful though they are, found that the distances between watering points were too great. The car enabled explorers to operate in the desert. That's my first point. The second point is that these people going in their cars were doing science. And whereas a lot of explorers in other parts of the world were exploring just for the sake of it, in the Libyan desert, people were exploring because they wanted to do science. And this shows the sheer size of the Libyan desert in comparison with India. And it's a desert with huge sand seas, including the Great Sand Sea, and huge areas of wind molded terrain, which are called yardangs. And the first traveller to go there wasn't British, but German, a man called Friedrich Gerhard Rolfs. He was a, a great traveller, and he was a man with German thoroughness who even had himself circumcised so he could travel in the Muslim world. And he went across the Great Sand Sea on the borders of Libya and Egypt to the secret oasis of Kufra. And we note that he took with him all sorts of scientists, botanists, geologists, paleontologists, astronomers, and a photographer. And he uh, was the great German explorer, but also there were a series of great British explorers, many of whom worked for the government of Egypt in its desert survey department. And we see them all grouped here, smartly dressed as one befits, as befits British gentlemen with ties and nice suits and lovely shoes and so forth. One of them is even wearing a fez. And amongst their number is Dr. John Ball and Dr. Beadnell. And Beadnell was one of the first of these people working for the Egyptian government to do science work and exploration. And he went to Karga Oasis and he went to Fayoum and he was working on ground water. He found water that would enable uh, cultivation to be undertaken. And he made observations on sand dunes because in the cargo oasis, the dunes are extremely mobile and they were causing all sorts of problems because they encroached upon agricultural land. So he made some of the first maps of these crescentic bark and dunes and recorded the rate at which they were moving. Another man at the same time, though he didn't work for the survey department, he was very rich, he didn't need to work for anybody, was W.J. Harding King. And he was very interested in the Tuaregs, but he also again, like Beadnell, did observations on sand dune movement and evolution. But the great breakthrough really in the exploration of the Libyan desert came during the First World War when the British government set up the light car patrols made up of Model T Fords. And the leading light here was Claude Williams, a New Zealander, but with him was also a diminutive little man, rather deaf, called John Ball, the little doctor. And together they went extraordinary distances across the Libyan desert, even getting to the great sandstone cliffs in the southwest of Egypt on the border with Sudan, called the Gilf Kabir. So they did fantastic uh, survey work and created the maps upon which a lot of uh, subsequent exploration was based. Well, so far I've mentioned uh, men, but in fact, one of the features of exploration of the Libyan desert was the role of some woman archeologists, Gertrude Caton Thompson and Eleanor Gardner. And they again used uh, Ford cars to explore the desert, which in spite of its aridity, had very, very rich remains of prehistoric cultures. They were very, very intrepid indeed. So far, I've talked about a German, I've talked about the British, but the Italians, of course, who operated in Libya, uh, also undertook important work. And the most notable person here was Ardito Desio, who was a geologist. And he went all over the Libyan desert and was the man who found the oil, which was the foundation, of course, of the subsequent economy of Libya. And in common with one or two 
of the other desert explorers, he lived to a great age. He died uh, well over 100 years old. And uh, another man who lasted a long time uh, was another British explorer, Ralph Alger Bagnold. He was a young soldier in the First War, mentioned in dispatches, but he then read engineering tripos at Cambridge before being posted to Egypt. And he and his chums discovered the joys of motoring around the Middle East in Model T cars. And he started off by going to Jordan and then the very far north of Egypt. They developed the techniques which would enable them to penetrate the Libyan desert. These little cars had condensers to save water. They had balloon tires to enable them to go more speedily and easily through the sand. They also developed the use of sand ladders, sun compasses for navigation, and radio fixes for navigation. Bagnold was a techie. And they did a series of, of trips. Uh, one in 1929 went from Cairo across to the Great Sand Sea. First time really the Sand Sea had been penetrated by motor car. And then in 1930, they did an even more ambitious journey and they went through the Sand Sea and then down towards modern day Sudan before returning up the Nile Valley and so back to Cairo. But one of their biggest expeditions was that in 1932, it was over 6,000 miles long, of which 5,000 miles were in new country where there were no pre existing tracks. They went right across to the Sahara Triangle in what is now Libya. They went across to Chad and they went all the way down into the middle of Sudan. An enormous journey in these primitive little cars, which were always getting bogged down. And they also, again, it's part of Bagnall's technical uh, skills, they used aircraft for the first time for resupply. And then perhaps his most interesting expedition was in 1938, when fascinated by sand and sand dunes, he started doing measurements of sand movement in the field. And he took with him a, a, a surveyor, a geomorphologist, and an anthropologist all combined, Ron Peel, and they went all the way down to Gilkur, Kabir and Uwainat on the borders of Egypt and Sudan. And they actually did work in the field monitoring the movement of sand grains. They also noted in the Gilf Kabir, which Ball and so forth had found, as I mentioned earlier, these extraordinary valley systems which were due to groundwater sapping springs eating back into the sandstone cliffs. And I'll show a version of this, but from Mars, later in this talk. But Bagnold was fascinated by what he called promiscuous barkans. These are these crescent-shaped dunes which climb upon one another. He was fascinated by the fact that outside crystalline science, you had these most regular forms at this scale in nature. And having been invalided out of the army because he was alleged to be ill, uh, he set about measuring wind processes in the laboratory and he had an association with Imperial College London. So here was this soldier doing this fantastic fundamental work for which he was later to get a fellowship of the Royal Society. But his scientific work was interrupted because the Second World War came along and because Bagnold was a soldier and knew how to get around the desert, he became the commander of the LRDG, the Long Range Desert Group. And of course, they harried the Axis powers using their two wheel drive uh, Chevrolet uh, vehicles. And it was during the war in 1941 that Bagnold's book, The Physics of Blown Sand and Desert Dunes, occurred. This is what he got his uh, Fellowship of the Royal Society for. And it's still the work we all depend upon for understanding sand dunes. And it was a great tribute to Bagnell that in 1980, uh, an international team involving Egyptians and Americans redid Bagnell's 1938 expedition and started to use Bagnell's observations in the search for analogues 
of the features that were being found on Mars as a result of space exploration. So they studied the dunes, the wind fluted yardangs, and the groundwater sapping. And I promised a picture of groundwater sapping on Mars to compare with the Gil Kabir, and here is a picture of groundwater sapping on Mars. And you'll remember also I mentioned wind fluted terrain, yardangs. Here are yardangs on Mars. So my message has really been uh, quite simple, that from the days of Rolfs through Beadnell, Harding King and Ball, to the intrepid archaeologists Caton, Thompson and Gardner, through to the days of Desio, to Bagnold and Peel, who he worked with, and then to the space effort of Farouk El Baz, we have a situation of great explorers doing great science. <laughs>